Did dinosaurs form pair bonds? I'm going to suggest that maybe they did, that we have fossil evidence to suggest that male and female dinosaurs may have paired up like modern birds, mating for the long term, perhaps even for life. And I'm going to suggest that we actually see this in the fossils, but that it just hasn't been really recognized. So birds, birds are modern dinosaurs. They are the living descendant of theropod dinosaurs adapted for, fl for flight. And they're highly diverse and they have a diverse range of reproductive strategies. Some birds are highly promiscuous. Peacocks, for example, will mate with multiple females. Some birds are promiscuous in the reverse way. We have in certain species of Jacana, the female will mate with multiple males. But a common pattern that we see in modern birds is monogamy. That is birds pairing up, forming long-term pair bonds. And we see this in birds like penguins, parrots, puffins, albatrosses. And the males and females will pair up to take care of their offspring, to take care of their eggs, uh, mating for long periods, even for life. Now, modern birds are dinosaurs, and they are, of course, very different. They tend to be a lot smaller. They're adapted for flight and so on and so forth. But as the closest relatives of dinosaurs, I would suggest that they provide a potential model for dinosaur behavior. The other thing to keep in mind is that the dinosaurs themselves were extraordinarily diverse. They were around, the non-avian dinosaurs were around for around 150 million years, and we have this extraordinary diversity. We have these long-necked sauropods, we have duckbill dinosaurs, horned ceratopsians, tyrannosaurs, raptors, etc., etc., etc. So we have all these different branches of the dinosaur and family tree, and then within these major groups, we have dozens, hundreds, uh, even thousands of species. It is very, very unlikely that they all made it in exactly the same way. So... Maybe the vast majority of all dinosaurs did not pair up, but is it really likely that none of them did out of all of these thousands of species that existed over millions of years? It seems likely that at least some of them may have mated for life and made it for, or mated for long term. Uh, so how might we recognize that and what might that look like? So the reason I'm doing this talk is because of a recent paper describing a new species of Oviraptorosaur from China. And this is an animal called Yuan Yang Long, if I'm pronouncing that right. Uh, and it was discovered as not as a single dinosaur, but a, two dinosaur skeletons found together in a single block. This is very, very unusual. The vast majority of dinosaurs died alone. Uh, in other cases where we find more than one dinosaur, we typically find large numbers of them. You'll find a, an entire herd of dinosaurs that's perished after it wandered into a, into a swamp and became mired. Sometimes you'll find a herd of dinosaurs that's perished after in a flood and the bones are all kind of jumbled together. You get these vast bone beds of hundreds or thousands of individuals. So the typical pattern is one dinosaur, huge numbers of dinosaurs, and then very, very rarely you get two dinosaurs. So statistically, it must happen occasionally. Uh, but what's interesting is you see this pattern of finding pairs of dinosaurs quite often in the oviraptorosaurs. So this is another example of a pair of dinosaurs. This is a little oviraptorosaur, an oviraptorid called Con McKenai. And it was found, or these two animals were found in close association in the Dejocta formation of Mongolia. We have another example from this animal called Heowania Hwangai. Uh, a skeleton is found, uh, fairly complete, articulated, missing a few bits, and then a fragment of a second skeleton is found close close by. So there were two animals buried in close proximity. And I've also seen an unpublished example of this in another species of Oviraptorosaur uh, that hasn't been reported yet uh, from Mongolia, but two animals found close together. And what's really interesting is that most of these examples are uh, of a group called the Ingenians. These are smaller oviraptorosaurs that have specialized arms possibly used for digging or something. And so even within the oviraptorosaurs, most of the, exam most of the examples of dinosaur pairs come from oviraptorosaurs. Within the oviraptorosaurs, we see almost all the examples come from this one little subgroup of the oviraptorosauria. So this is interesting, and it seems if there was just kind of this random pattern of you know, just by chance, some dinosaurs are found alone, others in big groups, a few in pairs. You wouldn't find it concentrated so much in this one group. That suggests to me that this is not just an accident of taphonomy. It's reflecting something about biology, the correlation of this preservational mode with this particular group of dinosaurs. There is one exception I can think of to this idea that uh, oviraptorosaurs are the ones we primarily find in pairs. And that's this animal here. Uh, this is Leptoceratops gracilis from the Scholard Formation of Alberta. And two animals were found, uh, one literally on top of the other animal. So you have these two animals found in close proximity. 
Now, all this kind of raises a question. We have this hypothesis that, well, maybe these things are mated pairs, males and females, getting together and hanging out for long periods of time. Wouldn't that then predict that we, in fact, have males and females? And could you see that on the basis of the skeleton? Uh, and this is where things get a little bit interesting for this animal. So for the most part, it's very, very difficult to tell male and female dinosaurs apart. Uh, in humans, females have great big hips because they need to pass babies through the pelvic canal, and males don't. In dinosaurs, where they lay relatively small eggs, we don't see this extreme specialization. Male and female birds don't differ all that much in the pelvic canal, for example. And in dinosaurs, the eggs are even smaller. So you can't really use that trick. And we've struggled to find anything else that might separate male and female dinosaurs. In this animal, however, there is a peculiar difference. So one of these animals is larger and more robust. We might guess that's the male. And its tail is different. Both of them have a little bit of a tail fin. They have these kind of elongate neural spines going down the tail. But the larger, more robust animal has longer, taller neural spines. And the neural spines, instead of sloping backwards, they kind of stick straight up. So it has more erect neural spines and they're bigger. Uh, and could this be like a display feature that the male is using like kind of a little dorsal sail on the back to signal to the female? And this might seem speculative, but this is exactly what we see in certain species of lizards that have crests. So you have crested lizards like uh, certain species of Caribbean anole. You have a certain crested species of basculus lizards. And the males have bigger crests than the females. So this suggests to me that we have these skeletal differences that imply that, in fact, we do have a male and female here. We have this large, robust, sail-tailed individual. We have a smaller, more gray-sail animal that does not have this elaborate sail uh, on the tail, and that might represent the female. So again, uh, what I want to emphasize is the variability. Uh, in These behaviors are extraordinarily variable. They're very plastic. They evolve very rapidly. So many duck species, for example, are quite promiscuous. But within ducks, there are other ducks that are, are monogamous. For example, swans, the paradise shell duck, this species of kind of black and white-headed duck from New Zealand. They're, they're really, really pretty. I've seen them in the wild. They're beautiful, beautiful animals. And another thing to keep in mind uh, is, you know, because of these, these mating strategies evolve rapidly, with any, any given group of dinosaurs, there might have been a huge amount of variety. So within the Oviraptorosaurs, maybe the Ingenians were more typically monogamous. Maybe some of the others were less monogamous. Even within the Ingenians, you might have had a degree of variability. So I don't think we can really say hard and fast rules. These dinosaurs reproduce this way. These dinosaurs reproduce that way. Uh, but that also means that, you know, again, given the extraordinary variability we see in birds, it is highly unlikely that all dinosaurs reproduced in the, sum, in the same way. And maybe at least a few, a few of them were pairing up. And, and what would that look like? Well, I think it would look like these Oviraptorosaur skeletons we see. And I think it would look like this, this uh, Leptoceratops pair that we see. So last, uh, thinking about the science and how do we do science, uh, people might look at this and say, you're speculating about the, the reproductive biology of animals that have been dead for tens of millions of years. And this is speculation, isn't it? Uh, to which I would say, well, yes, of course it's speculation. Uh, that's part of the job of a scientist. Uh, a word we use instead of speculation is, is hypothesis. And that's how we make progress in science. Um, so I don't think speculation is a bad thing as long as you're open about how speculative it is and how confident you are in these predictions. Now, if I came out and said 100% certainty these animals are mated pair, that would be bad science. I cannot say that with that level of certainty. Um, but if I come out and say like, you know, hey, 50, 60% odds, maybe they are, I think that's that would be maybe more a realistic reflection of the evidence. Um, so another way of putting it might be that I'll bet you a dollar that these are mated pairs. I would not bet you a million dollars. And conversely, uh, oftentimes people will talk about things and say that we are highly, highly confident this is not speculation. And often what that is, uh, is not necessarily that these hypotheses are not speculative, but people are being overconfident in how they present their, their data. I mean, think about it. These animals have been dead for tens of millions of years. Uh, and we have a handful of fossils and we're trying to infer their biology, their evolution, their appearance, all this stuff, their relationships. How confident can we really be about any of this stuff? Uh, and saying that like, oh, I'm highly confident. Well, that's just kind of, you're typically overconfident when you're saying you're 100% confident about something in paleontology. We just don't know as much as we think we do. So for example, I might come up with the computer model and it proves with 100% confidence that T-Rex could not run. Uh, but you know, it, that could always be disproven. We could go out there tomorrow and find a trackway of T-Rex uh, that proves T-Rex could run. 
Uh, but then even that proof could be disproven. It could turn out that we, we were missing a few of the prints instead of being widely spaced prints. We'd admit they were actually closely spaced walking prints. We just were missing a few. They hadn't hadn't been properly cleaned off. Or maybe the trackway was a forgery. Uh, so it is the nature of science that we never know anything for certain. Hypotheses can always be disproven by additional evidence. Uh, so why speculate about this at all? Well, it helps drive science forward. Uh, I could be wrong. If people want to reject this idea, they're welcome to go out and look at evidence and come up with ra evidence and rationale to disprove it. And if it ends up disproven, we're further ahead. Um, conversely, maybe people find additional examples of this in oviraptorosaurs or the dinosaurs or find different ways of testing this hypothesis. Either way, the speculation will end up corroborated by future evidence. It will end up rejected by future evidence. And either way, we end up a little further along than we were.